Hi, my name is Jonathan Hicks, and this evening I'm joined by Mark. And we just finished playing Legends Untold, which essentially is like a small box version of an RPG. So each player gets a character. In this case, I was an evicted noble. Uh, Mark was playing a forge hand here with some lovely artwork. And you are exploring through a set of caves. Uh, there's a couple of different boxes for this one. Uh, we've got the uh, Weeping Cave set here. Um, so we're spending most of our time exploring through the caves. Now you get a scenario. In this case, we were doing one of the introductory ones, the Scout the Cave one. It's a bit of flavor text. And these complicated set of symbols here effectively tell you how to set up various decks. So um, there are potential obstacles and barriers you might pull. And a kind of adventure deck where you can get all sorts of things popping out of here. Um, enemies and... Uh, loot and things and all kinds of things to resolve events that might happen uh, but I'll take you through one sort of rough turn of play to explain how it works so uh, here we are in the waterfall and you can choose a different exit so there's like a dark exit over here or this is an ambient exit here and if you go through the dark exit you can potentially surprise enemies but you're more likely to get caught out by traps if you go for a brighter exit you're not likely to surprise the enemies but you'll be more wary of the traps so you have to sort of make a decision here um, and you decide one person to be the scout, uh, and the person at the back is going to be the guard. And then you typically reveal a new tile. So you can decide to sneak. We're not going to bother sneaking this time, but um, you find the footprints. There's the footprints, and it kind of slides under, so it makes this kind of snaking map. The cars go in sort of funny orientations, and you snake your way around. Um, and then we have to make a scouting test in this new area. It's a bit difficult to see because it's upside down. Uh, but essentially, because we've come from an ambient light location, we would have to roll nine. Now, all tests in this game generally are rolling three dice. You roll three dice, add them up, and you're trying to get nine or more. And six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I've just made it. So in that case, if we'd failed, we would become careless, which means booby traps and things get automatically triggered, which would be quite bad. Uh, but we've passed, so we become bold. That's great. Uh, and we have a, an obstacle here. So we would draw the first um, obstacle off the top of the obstacle deck. And um, what have we got? It's a treacherous bridge. Now this is a kind of test, um, and because it's a party table test, uh, we'd all have to have a go at this. But essentially each hero tests a certain stat. Now you've got different stats. If we look at the forge hand here, you can see you've got brawn, grace, handle, reason, etc. Uh, this one is testing grace. So he has a grace of two. And potentially you have cards, abilities that will help you. So you can tap the card here. So this, for example, would add to give you a bonus if you're doing a handle test. Uh, I'm not sure the forge hand does anything for grace. So he would roll his uh, three dice. And he's got, oh, that's um, 10, 14. Plus his grace of two would be 16. And so you kind of consult the table. Oh, he's done very well there. I found a good route. And uh, one other hero automatically succeeds. That's great. So then I can kind of follow him on his good route. So you have obstacles you have to overcome. Then that would get discarded once it's been resolved. And then you kind of move into the location and you resolve stuff on the card. Um, so typically, uh, you do the red ones. This is going to be a foe. So you draw from the adventure deck and you keep drawing until you get a foe. Now this is a loot, which means this will be guided by whatever foe we find. And look, here's a foe. It's a goblin drunk. Okay, now because there's two of us in our party... Uh, that means there's going to be two goblin drunks, each with one health. So you kind of track it with the little health things here. And we first of all roll to see if we surprise them. Mark, you want to roll for this. So you've got to get seven or more here to see if we surprise them. And, oh yes, we've yes. done very well. <laughs> if you get four more than the number here, then we actually surprise them, which gives us a bit of an advantage in combat. Uh, and combat's fairly straightforward. Uh, range would sort of shoot first, but these guys are actually melee, so we jump straight into melee combat. Um, we're also melee. Uh, the forge hand's got a worn axe here uh, and the way combat works is you roll your dice and you're rolling on a particular table so uh, mark rolls let's see what he gets first he's got 12 that's pretty good and so you can sort the table here and if you get 13 that would be a hit which would do one damage or more 15 or more is a critical hit which kind of gives you a bonus uh, 11 would push them back which gives you advantage now you remember i said we surprised them um, because we surprised them when we have advantage you have these little tokens to show you can have like plus two um, when you surprise them. So he'd actually be adding another two to this, which would give him 14. And that'd be a strike. So that would kill one of the goblin drunks and he would die. Um, but if he had not done so well, you can kind of trade blows, which means you both take a damage. Uh, you can get pushed back, which means that you have disadvantage. That would give you minus two on the next roll. 
Uh, or you can sort of fail epically if you roll really badly and you'll actually take a wound. Now the wounds are interesting in this game. Uh, these abilities you're saying you could tap them to get various benefits and things. Uh, when you take a damage you flip it over like this and it becomes drained they say. Uh, and these represent your wounds. So you have a maximum of three when you first start wounds that you can take. And if you take your third wound your hero becomes unconscious and needs healing. If you both, if you all become unconscious you sort of die and lose the scenario. So you kind of keep going through this fighting around to combat. Um, my evicted noble has a knife here and there's a slightly different table but the same kind of symbols here. You're just trying to get the high ones to do the damage. So let's say we managed to kill this and then the goblin drunk would go away and we would get the loot which in this case is a bit of food which would let us heal. That's great. We can discard this. One hero could heal two wounds. Great. So we'll discard that. Mark could get his two cards back. There we go. He's healed his wounds. And that's all we'd have to do in this um, particular location here, the shrine. Um, but there are some optional things. So there's a barrier here. We could draw the barrier and see what it is. It's an old wooden door. And it says one hero can test either. And this is like a, a sort of choice of different things. So you can cho choose your handle skill. Or there's another handle one. Or a brawn skill. You can try and bash the board down. Um, but you can see it's different difficulties. So it's 12 for that one, 14 for that one. And the green is effectively what you're getting if you succeed, and red is what you're getting when you fail. The hourglass is time. Now time is quite important. Typically when you explore a new location, you deal time off this deck. So you sort of spend a time, and then you can spend some more time later. And you keep going through, but when you deal the last card, you resolve it, and it's event. In this case, a step in the dark. And some bad things potentially happen, and it gets discarded. Then you reset this deck, and the next time you spend time, you carry on spending like this, until eventually... Oh, another event resolves. So as you go through the game and you're spending the time, the events are going to resolve faster and faster. So that's quite nice the way that works. Uh, but yes, if you manage to get through the barrier, if we su succeed the test, then you'd get what's behind the barrier, which in this case is another question mark. And whatever you draw off the top is... Oh, it's giant mushrooms, I think, Mark. Just And this would like be another test. You can decide, hmm, the mushrooms here smell delicious. Some might make it suitable for eating. So then you could roll and you could try and uh, eat the mushrooms. Uh, you could potentially heal here if you eat the mushrooms. But if it goes badly, you could become poisoned. So there's lots of tests like this. A lot of the cards have these tests where you're rolling to get certain numbers or you're doing certain tests depending on various stats on your character. Uh, but essentially, you go through exploring the various cards, trying to accomplish the goal for the scenario. Uh, in this particular case, we had to explore a certain number of cards. Uh, but there's a wide range of different scenarios here. These are all double-sided as well. Uh, and the game comes with a campaign which sort of leads you through a bunch of scenarios. So uh, there's plenty of different options there in terms of playing the game. What do we think? Yes, this was going to be a, a tricky one to sort of think about. Uh, I enjoyed what we did so far. I think uh, it does capture that feeling of um, the exploration feeling. I think that's the thing that it deals with best as you're going through the murky darkness and you're trying to avoid traps and not like you can risk on some tests if you like searching for treasure and stuff you might hit get traps so if you're not careful then you won't get damaged by that but you can waste time to uh be a bit more careful so you don't get damaged by it yeah i mean everything was fun it was it's it was a uh, fiddly to be taught and i'm assuming even more fiddly to learn the rules but once we like we were in for the second time of me playing it it actually flowed pretty quickly once once i'd gone through at least once there are lookups reasonably constantly mainly on the status effects i think that's but I guess the nature of that this sort of game is that status effects set the theme. You've got to, some people on fire, some people are poisoned, all the sort of things that do kind of capture the the flavour. I guess uh, I'm, I'm kind of with two minds on the map in a strange way. I, I think the map adds better to to envision it in your mind's eye, like and see it on the table. But actually, it does nothing. Uh, you could have a card that has a list of things that are on that place. And what that also means is this actually is very comparable to the Pathfinder adventure card game, where you have various locations you can visit and they're going to have stuff in the decks that come out. But this is quicker uh, and less combat orientated. And for me, actually, I actually preferred that. I, I preferred the fact that I was worrying about crossing a, uh, an unsteady rope bridge or something like that, as opposed to, and here's another monster to fight and I'm trying to hunt down the bad guy. I think ultimately this will live on the base of the variation on the scenarios. So if they're good, we tried to. They were different, but I suspect the general exploration is always going to be there in whatever game you do, other than maybe the odd one or two scenarios. Um, um, I think the levelling system 
Uh, Jonathan will be able to speak about it better than I do, but I have had a quick look while you're doing it. You essentially get better. So <laughs> uh, you get more options, more wounds, ultimately, because you have more more items or abilities and stuff, which is nice. You can develop a character. So I think it's good. It's it's very solid. And once you get over that initial head of there's a lot of tests and working out the ordering, a lot of following uh, the ordering of the cards step by step, which is. They're very helpful cards, but Jonathan pointed out to me, there's four cards and they're double-sided, so it gives you a good idea of how intricate some of the rules quite be for something that's in something a relatively small box. But I, I did definitely enjoy what we did. I'm just not sure how many more times I'd want to redo it again. It's, it's a tricky one for me to score. Rating? I think, well, I hate to give sevens because it every sevens are really easy to want to give i think it is to me somewhere between a six and a half and a seven i'm not sure which one yet though okay yeah i think it is tricky to place the genre they're going for here is a kind of rpg light so it gives you the feel of an rpg without all the overhead and the time and everything else and it's a very difficult balance to strike i think there is quite a bit of overhead in this anyway there's lots of different tests you get stage tests and party tests and basic tests and all kinds of different kinds of tests. And so there's lots of markers saying like help sheets. Now they're very well done. All the little um, reference cards that explain what you're doing are very clear. So that's great, but there's just so much of it. But that's kind of what you get in an RPG. There's tests all over the place. You get lots of stats and you're constantly testing this test or that test. And as you're getting loot, it's improving your abilities in various different tests. So it gives you that feel really well. I've been playing through the um, campaign with my son and that does a really good job. The story there is very good, I think. There's lots of flavor text before and after each particular episode. And the leveling system works well. Uh, you know, I was showing you these. You have these cards here. Effectively, you're getting extra cards here, potentially, uh, which, as Mark was saying, gives you extra wounds and extra abilities. Or you can actually upgrade your stuff. So if you upgrade this weapon, then you get the upgraded side. And essentially, the stats become a little bit better. So that's nice. And there is a, a feeling of progression. It's a great size in terms of the box. It's a really small box. The price point is really good as well. I think you're getting a lot of value for money in this game. It is quite the table hog though. So if you're thinking, oh, it's a small box, I'll be able to play it on the train or something. I don't think that's really feasible because the map does the whole sprawling, the cards all over the place, and you've got lots of different decks of cards for all the different kinds of, you know, the barriers and the obstacles and the booby traps and the foes and all the rest of it. There's just lots of stuff. It does take up quite a lot of space on the table. Um, I'm not so keen on the way the cards, um, like the location cards that uh, show you, if I just sort of show you here on the map, because the way they come out, you have this sort of random thing, which is sort of nice, but then they're coming out sometimes to like the upside down and, oh, it's very messy. <laughs> I'm not very keen on the messiness. It's a small thing, but it bugs me a little bit. Overall, I think it's a very solid package. And as I say, great value for money. So as long as you know what you're getting in for, I think there's a lot to like here. Um, but the campaign would be where I'd want to play it. Um, odd little random games of this, I don't know if they'd be that interested. I think overall, I'd give it a 7.5 out of 10. Alright, thanks very much for watching. That was Legends Untold.